Well, let's get to the real core of all of this. What's the biblical view? And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the days of Noah. You know, Jesus uh, gave four disciples a confidential briefing on his second coming. And uh, uh, the four disciples came to him to inquire of his return, and he detailed the preceding events that would uh, occur prior to his second coming. And his answer to them, these four guys, is so important, it's recorded in three of the four Gospels, Matthew 24 and 25, Mark 13, and Luke 21 and 22. But he opens and closes that briefing with a, a, a repeated admonition. Take heed that no man deceive you. And that occurs in Matthew 24, 4, and you'll find it's the theme of, of, of the, the entire presentation. We're dealing here in spiritual matters, and the attempt of the enemy will be to deceive us. But in the middle of this briefing, about verse 37 of Matthew 24, Jesus makes a very strange remark. He says, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now in the context there, what he may have been alluding to is simply that it'll be business as usual until, uh, just so it was business as usual until Noah and the ark, it'll be business as usual until he returns. And most people who read that passage assume that that's all he meant. It's just that it's going to come as a surprise. And yet there are many scholars from the context of the details of that passage feel he was giving us a hint of something deeper. And we really don't, won't understand what he's talking about unless we understand what the days of Noah were like. And so we're going to try to figure out what, the, what did Jesus really mean? As the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. So what you really need to do to get a handle on the UFO thing, strangely enough, is to do your homework in Genesis chapter 6. And I want, to, want you to notice the first two verses, and I want you to pay attention that the first two verses are a single sentence. Many people stumble because they don't realize that's a single sentence. I'll you see why it kind of, what I'm getting at in a minute. Genesis 6, verse 1. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the Benaiha Elohim, the sons of God, as it's translated, saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. One verse. Now the question is, um, this strange phrase, sons of God, uh, that can mean anything to us. Let's find out what the text really means, sons of God. It, what it is in the Hebrew is, remember Hebrew goes from right to left, so if you're watching the slides here, uh, remember all languages go towards Jerusalem. Nations that are east of Jerusalem go from right to left, the language. Nations that are west of Jerusalem go from left to right. So just break, so Hebrew, Aramaic, Arabic, uh, Sanskrit, whatever, they go right to left. Anyway, uh, so if you're reading the Hebrew here, recognize it goes from right to left. Bene ha Elohim, the sons of the God. Now, sons of God, Bene ha Elohim is, is a term that's always used of a direct creation of God. Adam was a direct creation of God. You and I, in the natural, are not. We're sons of Adam. That's our problem. That's what the book of Romans is all about. And, uh, but as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. The term is, has technical meaning in the New Testament as well as the Old. In the Old Testament, this term in the Hebrew, in Job 1.6, Job 2.1, Job 38.7, uh, is always used of angels, because they are a direct creation of God. In the New Testament, also Luke 20.36. Also the book of Enoch, now I'm, don't misunderstand my use of this as a, as a citation here. The book of Enoch was very popular from about the second century before Christ to the second century after. It is not an inspired book, I wouldn't treat it that way, but it is useful in understanding the vocabulary and the grammar of the time. And clearly in the book of Enoch, it made, this term is used there also to refer to angels, and it deals with it greatly. The Septuagint, this is the translation of the Hebrew scriptures that went from Hebrew to Greek. If you were a, a Jew living in the time of, of uh, say, the uh, second century before Christ, the enforced language worldwide, the commercial language, was Greek. 
thanks to Alexander the Great and following, uh, that was the common language. If you were a Jew uh, in business anywhere in the world, you had to speak Greek to survive. You may have known Hebrew for religious purposes, but Hebrew was to the Jew in those days what Latin is to a Catholic today, basically a language for religious purposes. So one of the things, if you were Jewish in those days, what you would have liked to have had is a copy of the, what we call the Old Testament, the Tanakh, uh, in Greek, so you could read it. And because of that, under Ptolemy Philadelphus, he funded the translation of the Hebrew scriptures into Greek, started about 285 BC, finished about 270 BC, and the result of that work product, he got 70 of the top scholars, the word Septuagint is just 70, a fancy word for, a Greek word for 70. He got the 70 top scholars to do the translation, it took about 15 years. And uh, the result of that we have copies of. And it's known as the Septuagint translation of the Old Testament. And so it gives us the benefit of the precision of Greek on some of these issues. So it's a very, very powerful uh, resource for scholars. And the Septuagint also makes it clear that we're dealing here with uh, uh, angels, as we think of them. Now in Genesis 6, it came to pass when men began to multiply in the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wise of all whom they chose. The word sons of God, of course, is Benai Ha Elohim, sons of God, direct creation, term for angels saw the daughters of men. Now, by the way, what that really says in the Hebrew is Benoth Adam, daughters of Adam. I mention this because there have been contrived some strange interpretations of this passage that are commonly taught in most seminaries. And it's tragic because there's a view of this passage that has no scriptural support. And we'll talk about that because you'll, you'll run into it. Many people think that, that uh, this is strange stuff. And it is strange. It's even stranger than most people realize. So... Um, now, when you get down to verse 4 of Genesis 6, it says, There were Nephilim in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became the mighty men which were of old, men of renown. What this verse seems to indicate is that these Nephilim were the offspring of a strange union. The sons of God, these are angels according to the Hebrew uh, uh, precision here. They came in unto the daughters of men, daughters of Adam incidentally. This is not just Cain and Seth and any of that. This is the daughter, these, these are daughters of men. And they bear children to them. It's those children that are the Nephilim. Now what on earth is the Nephilim? That word Nephilim is a key word. We're going to talk a lot about that. Nephilim means the fallen one. It comes from the verb nafal, which means to fall, be cast down, to fall away, to desert. That's what a Nephilim is, a deserter, in a sense. What the passage portrays, and it's very difficult for many people to absorb this, it portrays fallen angels. These are not the good guys. Remember when Satan fell, a third of the angels fell with him. Not all of them, but a group of them, apparently, and we'll talk more about this in a minute, chose to try to create a hybrid race by cohabit. By, I don't know the technology. Uh, I, I'm not going to get into that. But they apparently uh, uh, were... See, angels can't multiply. Angels are eternal. There's, uh, reproduction is a process for mortals. But at the same time, Satan's got a problem. A third of the angels fell with him, so he's got a deficiency of two to one in any war that comes up, right? He's got to find, a, find a way to strengthen himself. This may be, this is just a, con, a, a conjecture that floats around. Now, the offspring are Nephilim. They're also called the Hagibarim, the mighty ones. And uh, now, where the confusion starts to set in is when this Hebrew passage was translated into the Greek in the Septuagint, the word they used for the Nephilim was gigantes. It sounds like giants. And it turns out they were giants, but that's not what the word means. Gigantis comes from gigas, which means earthborn. So in the Hebrew, they're called the fallen ones. In the Greek, they're called the earthborn. And uh, so let's keep that in mind. The fact that they were giants is like a pun. Yes, they were giants, but that's not what the word means. It carries a different meaning. Let's go on a little further in verse 9 of Genesis 6. It says, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. 
Terrific verse. We've all read it. But most of us may not pay attention to what that's really saying. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. What does that mean? Well, the word perfect in the Hebrew is tamim. What it means is without blemish, sound, healthful, without spot, unimpaired. What that verse seems to indicate is that Noah's genealogy was unblemished. Now this comes on right after the verses that talk about these strange goings on where these fallen angels are, have created some weird form of hybrid. But Noah was unblemished in his generations and that's one of the reasons that God chose Noah and his three sons and their four wives to start over again. The purpose of the flood was not just that there was sin in the land. There was, and that's emphasized. But if, if, if sin brings the flood, we better get some life jackets. <laughs> no, there's something far deeper going on. That's what I want to sensitize you for when you do your own study and come to your own conclusions. But I want you to recognize there's something much more profound that God, there's a problem that God was solving. And that is that Satan's strategy was to contaminate the human race. Now, by the way, if, if this view is correct, I'm presenting to you what's sometimes called the angel view of Genesis 6. That is not taught in most seminaries, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But if that view is correct, as I've suggested from the exegesis of the Hebrew in Genesis 6, it will be confirmed in the New Testament, at least twice, and it is. When you get to the book of Jude, Jude makes an allusion to this very event in Jude verses 6 and 7. Jude is just one chapter. But in verses 6 and 7, Jude writes, And the angels, and by the way, this is in the Greek, so it's not ambiguous. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of that great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah, and the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Jude is talking about judgment on the bad guys. And he mentions among these things, these angels which sinned back in Genesis 6. These angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains. These angels that participated in Genesis 6 apparently are chained awaiting a special judgment. We'll talk, it's going to, Peter's going to talk about that in a minute. And he even, he even he, uh, Jude asks to add something else here. He makes a comparison between the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah and the sins of these angels in that they were doing that which is unnatural. Sodom and Gomorrah, homosexuality. We're all familiar with that. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth an example of suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. He's using that as an additional exemplar, lumping the angels with him. The angels went after strange flesh, so did the Sodom and Gomorrah. They're both reserved for special judgment. You follow me? You can read it, check it out yourself. That's one confirmation. That's in Jude. Let's take a look at, uh, it, see, they left their own habitation. We're going to come back to that in a minute. And going after strange flesh is the, is the illusion here. Let's turn to 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. 2 Peter. In Peter's second letter, he says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to Tartarus, it's translated hell in your English Bible, but the Greek word is Tartarus, and it's the only place that word appears in the Bible. I'll come back to that. If God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to Tartarus, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved on judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, and he goes on. So Peter does a couple of things here. He again alludes to the angels that sinned. They're cast into Tartarus. That's a, I'll tell you more about that in a minute. And they're reserved unto, for a final judgment. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah. In other words, he ties that event to the days of Noah. So he not only confirms Genesis 6, but he also links it to the days of Noah. Okay. The word Tartarus deserves some comment. The problem with this word is it doesn't appear anywhere else in the Bible, but it does appear in Greek literature. It's the Greek term for the dark abode of woe. It is the pit of darkness in the unseen world. It shows up, in, for example, in Homer's Iliad, where Tartarus is as far below Hades as the earth is below heaven. 
So where's Tartarus? I don't know, and I don't want to find out. So Tartarus was a term for a deep, special, it, is so, it, it was regarded as, as far below Hades as the earth is below heaven. So it's, it's where these angels are chained until, until the final thing. Now, if you study Greek, classic Greek mythology, you run into the titans. These, these creatures in, their myth, in the legends and the myth, myths were partly terrestrial and partly celestial. They rebelled against their father Uranus. And after a prolonged contest were defeated by Zeus and condemned where? Into Tartarus. Do you see a parallel brewing here? I'm going to suggest to you that the legends of the ancient Greeks embody the truth of what really happened in the past, that there were these strange creatures generating hybrids that the Greek called titans. And we see Zeus in many forms. We see, we see uh, Atlas and Hercules. Atlas and Hercules from, from Greek mythology were what would be called in the Hebrew Nephilim, offspring of an intermarriage between a god and a woman. And uh, so, now these legends, we, we obviously we see in the Sumer culture, in Assyria, in Egypt, I'll show you a few things, in the Incas, the Mayan, the Epic of Gilgamesh, in the Persian mythology, and certainly in the Greek mythology, which most of us as products of Western civilization are familiar with, also in India, Bolivia, South Sea Islands. Every one of these cultures, including and the American Indians, every one of these cultures have legends of the star people. These people that came, these gods or demigods, whatever, came and cohabited with women and produced, a, produced hybrids. I discover from some uh, apparent experts in the American Indian culture that this business of holding a hand up saying how, that's Hollywood. Uh, but what apparently was the practice when they met a stranger was to hold up the hand so they could count fingers. They had a terror of the six-fingered people. And if you go to uh, the ruins at Chaca, New Mexico, one, they have a, one of the exhibits there that you want to take a look at are the famous pictographs. And among those pictographs, you'll find the, the fearsome six-fingered hand as part of that. The, I came across something else that's kind of, the Pawnee Indians have an account that Bill, you remember uh, Buffalo Bill, real name is William Cody. He wrote his autobiography in 1920, very colorful guy. You can get his book, it's popular. But there's an interesting quote in his book by, Bill, by Buffalo Bill, Bill Cody, uh, published in 1920. He says, while we were in the Sand Hills scouting the Niobara uh, country, the Pawnee Indians brought into camp some very large bones, one of which the surgeon of the expedition pronounced to be the thigh bone of a human being. The Indians said the bones were those of a race of people who long ago had lived in that country. They said these people were three times the size of a man of the present day. And they were so swift and strong that they could run by the side of a buffalo and taking the animal in one arm could tear off a leg and eat it as they ran. <laughs> I don't know what to make of that. It's in his autobiography. It's published in 1920. Uh, I don't think he was worried about UFOs and stuff, but you, it is a uh, interesting allusion to the Indian, Indian lessons. Uh, in the uh, early country, uh, Asher, they, they always speak of the flying god of Asher. And this diagram you see in many, many of the ancient uh, monuments of uh, a man with a bow, like Nimrod perhaps, and, uh, the, uh, and the wings. Uh, and you see this on the monuments. Here's an example of them. As you go through Egypt, this is a, a, a snapshot in one of the tombs. Of, I think it's Ramesses II, but you see in all of them. You'll notice on the headers of these, uh, uh, of these passages, again, you see a, uh, uh, the way, a flying disc again and again and again uh, as you go through Egypt. You look at the, the headers on uh, many of these monuments. You look up there and you always see the flying disc, sometimes with a snake involved. And uh, you see it again and again and again. Sometimes you see uh, uh, a person involved with these, and you even find the disc being transported from place to place. So this seems to be something more than simply a symbol of, a, um, of, a, of, a, of a, some icon that they're worshiping. Well, you say, gee, Chuck, this angel view is kind of strange. I hadn't heard of that before. You know, I, when, when, our, when our book was published, I got, the, I got telephone calls from top executives of some of the Christian publishers 
that were angry, not at me, at their seminary background, because many of them are graduates of, of, of seminaries, and they were never taught the angel view. And uh, that's disturbing. You may not agree with it, but it still should be taught as one of the alternative views. What most people have taught, and you'll find it in many Bible handbook stuff, the so-called lines of Seth view. The idea that we're the sons of God really refers to the, 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 the line of Seth, the leadership of the line of Seth. And uh, the daughters of Adam really means the daughters of Cain, not Seth. And the sin that uh, is, is dominant there is their failure to maintain separation, is the concept. Now, it doesn't explain how the offspring of these unions resulted in these strange creatures. You know, if you have a believer and unbeliever marry, they may have monsters, but not, they're not monstrous. Okay. <laughs> um, this whole view of the so-called lines of Seth emerged in the 5th century in the early church. Celsus and Julian the Apostate used the traditional belief. See, this belief that I've shown you was taught by the ancient rabbis in, in the Old Testament period and also taught by the early church up through the 5th century. But Julian, uh, Celsus and uh, uh, Julian the Apostate used the traditional belief to attack Christianity. They made fun of these people who thought the angels had so forth. They attacked it. Julius Africanus resorted to this Sethite idea as a more comfortable ground. It's more, people find that more, less spooky. And uh, it just, uh, Cyril of Alexander used it to repudiate the orthodox position. Augustine comes along, who it was a profound influence, and he did many, many great things. He dealt with a number of heresies, but he embraced the Sethite series, and that, of course, uh, made it uh, orthodox. And so this view of this line of Seth prevailed all through the medieval church. It isn't until you go back to the text and do your homework that you begin to realize that the line of Seth has absolutely no scriptural support. The text itself, the sons of God is never used of believers in the Old Testament. That, that, that's contrived. Seth was not God. Cain was not Adam. The sons of God are not the sons of Seth. And uh, the daughters of Adam were not just the daughters of Cain. They were both. It was, uh, that if you recognize, recognize the first two verses are one sentence, a lot of that becomes very obvious. And if, if there's daughters of men, where are the daughters of Elohim? There's, if there's sons of Elohim, where's the daughters of Elohim? See, you sort of wonder, what, what, there's no mention of that. The grammatical antithesis is ignored, and I won't get to that here, but this idea of maintaining separation doesn't occur until chapter 11 of Genesis, not 6, it's five chapters later that we have the Babel and all of that. The separation is imposed upon Isaac and his following, not on Ishmael or the others. It was Isaac and Jacob that were told to keep themselves separate. And that was not imposed on Seth and Cain. That's all contrived. In fact, Genesis 6 verse 12 says, all flesh was corrupted. So the idea that lines of Seth were the good guys and the line of Cain was the bad guys is contrived. That's not what it's all about. See, the inferred godliness of Seth is contrived. Why was only Enoch and Noah's eight spared? Were they only good guys? No, it's God's grace, of course. They took wives that they chose, implies some forcing functions here. And if that's all, if they, Seth were such good guys, why did they perish in the flood? Doesn't, see, it doesn't, doesn't compute. And uh, it, Enosh, it was incidentally Enosh's Seth's son that initiated the defiance of God. Most people don't realize that because of mistranslation. Genesis 4.26 should read, Then men began to profane, not call upon, profane the name of the Lord. So renders the Targum of Ankylos, the Targum of Jonathan, the major Hebrew rabbis, Eckhart Rashi, uh, Maimonides, and the rest, and of course, Jerome. So the daughters of Cain, this, this is not a subset of the daughters of Adam. There's no basis for that. And the Cainites were not necessarily godless. You know, I've always wondered in Genesis 4 why we have the genealogy of Cain. Because they're going to all perish in the flood. Why does the scripture give us the genealogy? Well, there may be other reasons, but one reason is if you read the names, you'll find the name of God in them. You get the impression that Cain messed up, killed his brother, yes, but he raised his kids and grandchildren to worship God. He was a godly guy, and the names reveal that. So the idea that daughter, the, the, you know, the, the descendants of Cain were bad guys is, is a contrivance of modern scholarship. And why are they just daughters of Cain? Were the daughters of Seth so unattractive? What's the deal here? So that's, of course, and of course, the, the, the death knell to this theory is that the, 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 the unnatural offspring. What were the Nephilim then? See, they were supernatural offspring, the mighty men, the Geberim. Does that mean only X chromosomes among the Sethites? There are no women of renown recorded. And, and what really made Noah's genealogy so distinctive? It wasn't contaminated by this, this, these goings on.
And as I pointed out, we have these New Testament confirmations. We looked at several of them, and uh, I won't get into that here. The angel view was the traditional rabbinical view in, in the Old Testament. The Book of Enoch is just an example of their belief system, uh, emphasizes that. The Testimony of the Twelve Patriarchs, these are not inspired books, but they do reflect the thinking of the times. Jose Josephus clearly uh, understood this. The Septuagint clearly spells it out. The Church Fathers in the first few centuries, Philo, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, and the rest of them, all taught this. Modern scholarship, Pember, DeHaan, McIntosh, Dillich, Gablin, Arthur Pink, Donald Barnhouse, who I respect highly, Henry Morris, Merrill Unger, Arnold Fruchtenbaum, terrific scholar, Hal Lindsey, Chuck Smith, others. Modern scholarship recognizes the angel view. The Sethite view is uh, the text itself destroys it. The inferred separation is nonsense. The inferred godliness is contrived. The inferred Canaanite substitute of the Adamites is not contrived. All this is contrived. The unnatural offspring implied is the death knell to the view in my opinion. Of course, the New Testament, Jude and Second Peter, nail it. But there's another issue as I got into this, not just for this study. It's important for us to understand that the Nephilim were not confined before the flood. We don't know how they came about, but they were Nephilim after the flood, when, Josh, when uh, Moses sends in the 12 tribes. In Numbers 13, verse 33, they encountered the Nephilim in the, in the land. Who built the pyramids? Let's see, there's another quick ancillary question here. Who built the pyramids? The Great Pyramid of Giza, the Stonehenge in Britain, and the circle of the Rephaim in the Golan. And uh, they're up in the Golan Heights, there's an unexplored monument we discovered uh, up there that is called the Gilgal Rephaim. This is, who are the Rephaim? And uh, the, the, the circle of Rephaim is five circles, 20 ton stones, about 155 meters in diameter, dated to about 3000 BC. It's built on a flat plateau. And by the way, you can only detect its architecture from above, strangely, and so forth. Um, there's, there's some others too that are, if you fly over that area, you see the hints of others. These have never been explored. And uh, the point I want to get across, it's, it, it startled me to realize that this is not simply a study in Old Testament ancient history. It is essential to understand, if you're going to understand your Bible, understand prophecy. You need to understand that there were, there were Nephilim, Nephilim after the flood. In Genesis 4, it says there were, there were uh, Nephilim in those days and also after that. It even hints at it right there. In Genesis 14 and 15, we discover there are four tribes at least, the Rephaim, the Emim, the Horem, and the Zamzumim, that Joshua was instructed to wipe out every man, woman, and child. Boy, that sounds like genocide. It was, because we had the same thing, not a flood this time, it was a local situation. And uh, Arba, Anak, and his seven sons, the Anakim, are talked about not just in the Bible, but also in Egypt, by the way. They were encountered in Canaan, Numbers 13, 33, when the, when the uh, 12 spies went. The, when they came back, the, Joshua and Caleb had the good report. The other 10 guys said, hey, there's Nephilim in the land. That's the word they used. They were giants. We are like grasshoppers in their sight. That's not an exaggeration. They had reason to be terrified. Obviously, Joshua and Caleb had uh, faith in God. We're, you know, God's on our side, let's go. But, uh, and it's easy to disparage the other 10 guys. You need to understand they had, on the one hand, some reason to be cautious. In Deuteronomy 3 and Joshua 12, we encounter Og, the king of Bashan. He's the king of the giants, the Rephaim. Goliath, remember he had four brothers. That's why David picked up five stones when he crossed the brook. Why? He was ready for all five of those guys. By the way, what does the Golan Heights, Hebron, and the Gaza Strip have in common? They're in the news day all the time, right? These are the areas that Joshua failed to exterminate the Rephaim. The word Rephaim means the dead, the walking dead. Isaiah 26, 14 says they cannot be resurrected. These are strange creatures. And uh, it's interesting if you study the strongholds uh, that uh, they fail to defeat, you'll notice that those same regions are the territories, the so-called West Bank, that are in dispute today. I think that's fascinating. The, the Joshua's, not Joshua, but his, his descendants failed to deal with these issues and they plague them to this very day. The Golan was called uh, Bashan, and it's just when Jesus is hanging on the cross in Psalm 22, verse 12, he says a strange thing. He says, many bulls have compassed me, strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. I have no idea what that means, but I suspect he's not talking about cattle. I think he's talking about some kind of demon oppression that's involved. I think it's an allusion to the Rephaim. 
Let's talk a little bit about the nature of angels because that's really at the root of this problem. You notice we learn a lot about angels by looking at the Bible. They always appear in human form. They look human. In fact, many people entertain them unaware as we find out. Sodom and Gomorrah, the, the homosexuals were after them. That tells you something. I don't want to be too graphic here. And at the resurrection and at the ascension, there's always a pair of angels. And they're like men. They look like men standing there. They spoke. They took men by the hand. They ate meals with them. They're capable of direct physical combat. The Passover in Egypt was by a death angel. In, in the book of... Uh, uh, by uh, the uh, second kings, uh, slaughter of the 185,000 Syrians. One angel after night slaughters 185,000 Syrians. You don't mess around with angels. Now, and they don't marry in heaven. Now, that, that, that's a phrase. By, and, uh, by the way, I'm making a contrast here with the demons of the New Testament are not like this. They apparently are powerless except to the extent they can embody some person. They're not like angels. Don't think, distinguish between angel, fallen angels, the bad guys, and the demons. The demons apparently are disembodied spirits looking for embodiment. The angels don't have that problem. They apparently can materialize. All the way through the scripture, we see them that way. We do know they don't marry. Because can the question everybody has: Can angels have sex? The scripture says no. No, it doesn't say that. Jesus says, for in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God. He's talking about uh, 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 that in a resurrection bodies, we don't have sex because we, we're immortal. There is no procreation. There is no uh, reproduction issue. And angels, in, he's talking here about the angels of God in heaven. I would not speculate on the technologies available to an angel who falls. And that's what we're dealing with here. Now, there's a strange word that gets overlooked by the scholars uh, in general, and, and I've, I've participated in some translation issues on this very issue. There's a word called okaterion, and it refers to the body as the dwelling place for the spirit. It only occurs twice in the scripture, and it's very interesting where it does. It occurs in Jude 6, and it's the word that describes what the fallen angels disrobed from. And in 2 Corinthians 5, 2, it speaks of, it alludes to the heavenly body that you and I as believers aspire to be clothed in. Same word, okay, I think it's a technical term that's overlooked by the scholars. In uh, Jude 6 and 7, it says, when the angels which kept not their first estate left their own habitation, that word habitation is okaterion. They disrobed from the, 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 the body that they were given to indulge in this mischief in Genesis 6. The angels which kept not their first estate, but left their ha own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness in the ju judgment of that great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and so we, we went through that before. The word is Ocaterian. In 2 Corinthians 5, 1 and 2, Paul tells the Corinthians, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And for this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. The word translated house is okaterion. That which those angels abandon is what we aspire to. That kind of, that kind of a, uh, a habit, if you will. Okaterion again. Well, let's move on. The coming to cosmic deception, what's the biggest lie of all? You know, it's interesting. This all started back in Genesis 3. When God declared war on Satan, he says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and he shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Everybody, and from this verse, we get one of the messianic titles of Christ, the seed of the woman. What many people overlook, there's two seeds mentioned here. The other seed is the seed of the serpent. And so we have the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And the seed of the serpent, we find all kinds of idioms, the red dragon in, in, in Revelation 12, the coming world leader, as I sometimes call him, the false prophet in Revelation 13. These forces are still at work and behind the world powers today. Check out Daniel 10 and really understand what's going on there. All of us have studied Daniel 2 and the, the sequence of nations, or empires I should say, that were re-echoed in Daniel 7, the winged lion, bear on one side, the leopard, the terrible beast, the tenets. Uh, again, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome 1 and 2. Uh, we've been through that in our prophetic studies and most people recognize the iron, iron mixed with clay is is the Roman Empire, don't confuse that with Western Europe, the Roman Empire, uh, part one and part two. 
Well, we live in a world, what's, what's going on in this world? There's a new world order, a world without borders is the concept. The end of the independent nation state. Multiculturalism is in. Check your faith at the door, we're gonna all compromise. And this is all heading for a centralized socialistic government. And there are a couple of forcing functions. Every freedom-loving per person considers this an anathema, except the problem is there's no way to avoid it. Nuclear proliferation is part of it. We're on the threshold right now of nuclear war because of this very issue. But there's another forcing function that nobody talks about. The possibility, ultimately, not yet, but coming, a cosmic threat of some kind. You say, Chuck, that's way out. That's fringe stuff. Really? Um, let's talk about the miry clay. You know, Daniel, in Daniel's famous vision of the metal, multi metal image, the last phase was, of course, the iron mixed with clay, the ten toes. What is miry clay? Miry clay is clay made from mire or dust, if you will. And everybody talks about the, 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 the clay in, in, in the ten toes of Daniel's imagery. No one, I'm, I'm guilty too, paid any attention to Daniel's explanation of it. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 43, he's explaining the whole thing. He's interpreting the vision for you. When he gets to this, in verse 43, he says, Whereas thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave to one another, and so on. You know, that phrase, I read that a hundred times over the last 30 years and didn't hit me until uh, this in-depth study. Um, they, the, the miry clay refers to a they. It's a personal pronoun. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. In order to mingle themselves with the seed of men, they have to be something other than the seed of men. Or it makes no grammatical or, or logical sense. So the they that are going to do the mingling are not the seed of men. Oh, could this be a hint of some mischief in the end times analogous to the uh, uh, mischief in Genesis 6? I think so. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Boy, there it stares. It stares anyway. Uh, but the coming great deception, Jesus opens and closes his Matthew 24 thing. He says, there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders. Insomuch that, that if it were possible, they should deceive the very elect. What's going to protect you? Your intellectual background? Your knowledge of physics? No way. No way. If it were possible, they would deceive the very elect. The only thing, the only thing that can save you from this deception is your spiritual condition by being in Christ. They shall show great signs and wonders. They're going to do things that are going to uh, uh, violate apparent, our apparent knowledge of reality. We get to 2 Thessalonians, Paul in, in 2 Thessalonians 2 has a lot to say about this. He says, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now hindereth will hinder until he be taken out of the way. And then shall the wicked one be revealed whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. The wicked one is going to do miracles. Be prepared for some political leader to raise people from the dead. We're not ready for that. The mystery, see, I think the restrainer is restraining far more than you and I have any idea. I, more than we have capacity to imagine. I think after the rapture, it's going to get so strange, it's going to be way out there. Now, where does this wicked one come from? It surprises many to realize the scripture tells us. In Revelation 11 and Revelation 17. Revelation 11, verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Where is this guy coming from? From out of the abuso. So he's not just some political leader that happens to be kind of gifted. No, this guy is empowered by Satan himself. And he's coming out of the abuso himself. You get to Revelation 17. The beast that thou sawest was and is not shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, go into perdition, and they that dwell among the earth shall wonder whose names are not written in the book of life. The only thing that can protect you from all of this is your position in Christ. So in 2 Thessalonians goes on, And because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved, for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Don't assume that, if you, that you can get saved after the rapture. People will be saved after the rapture. But if you've had an opportunity and turned down the redemption of Christ, this is what it's talking about. Because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved, and for this cause God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Be careful. Don't play that game. If you're going to accept Christ, do it now. Don't wait.